Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm here to present our work on evaluating the contextual integrity of privacy regulations, or Parents IoT Toy Privacy Norms versus COPPA. And this is joint work with Sarah Varghese and Nick Feemster from the Princeton University Center for Infotech Policy. And I want to point out that uh, Sarah Varghese uh, worked on this project uh, for her senior thesis uh, and was instrumental to um, getting it here today. So in uh, 2017, the Federal Trade Commission updated its guidance on COPPA to indicate that it did indeed apply to connected uh, Internet of Things toys. Uh, and for the duration of this talk, I'm going to refer to just COPPA, but oftentimes what I mean is uh, a combination of uh, COPPA the Act or the COPPA rule, which are the FTC's uh, guidelines on how online services need to handle uh, children's data. So devices that we're uh, thinking about here are from a variety, wide variety of types, toys like uh, internet connected teddy bears, robots, tablets, fitness trackers, that are all built and targeted towards children under the age of 13. And so what we want to know is whether the data handling practices uh, that the FTC is requiring through COPPA are actually aligned with parents' privacy norms and expectations in this space. Uh, and even more generally, we'd like to know, you know how do we as a uh, community go about testing whether privacy regulations uh, in any area are aligning with the social and cultural privacy norms of the affected population. Now, of course, these questions beg uh, another question to begin with, which is how do we define privacy norms in the first place? And for that, we turn to uh, the theory of contextual integrity, uh, which is a privacy framework that was originally developed by Helen Nissenbaum at uh, Cornell Tech, uh, which defines privacy in terms of uh, norms of information flow appropriateness in specific contexts. That's, really, that's pretty philosophical, so let's break that down a bit further by saying that the contexts themselves can be defined according to five parameters. You have a sender, a subject, an attribute, an information type, a recipient, and a transmission principle. So for example, if you consider this example of an information flow of a doctor sharing a patient's medical records with another hospital for continuity of care, you can divide that into the five parameters. So the doctor here is the sender, uh, the patient is the subject, the medical records themselves are the attribute of the information type, uh, the other hospital is the recipient of the information, and for continuity of care is a criteria placed on the information transfer, also known as the transmission principle. So given this uh, very clear-cut five-parameter model of a context, uh, we can then use this uh, to construct uh, surveys which allow us to test whether uh, norms are being respected. And we've done something like this in the past. Uh, in our previous work, uh, we used the contextual integrity to try to discover Internet of Things privacy norms not related to children or toys. And so the work that I'm presenting today is building off of that, uh, where we're actually looking specifically at privacy norms regarding a particular piece of regulation. Uh, and this is, is a six-step process, and I'm going to go over each of these steps in detail. Uh, so the first, the first thing we do is we choose parameter values for each of those five parameters that are relevant to the regulation of interest. Uh, so here we chose as senders uh, a list of smart toys, uh, including robots, smart dolls, walkie-talkies, and others. Uh, for this subject and the attribute parameters, uh, we chose uh, different types of data that we know that these devices will collect in the wild, uh, things like child's location, uh, audio recordings, birthdays that are often uh, entered during account setup. And then as recipients, we, we chose manufacturers and third-party service providers, which are actually the two manufacturers, uh, sorry, the two recipients that are explicitly distinguished in uh, the COPPA rule uh, as having uh, distinct data handling requirements. Then, and this is another uh, distinction from the previous work, we pulled the transmission principles directly from uh, COPPA's six-step compliance plan. So these include uh, data handling requirements like if its privacy policy permits it, or if its owner is given verifiable consent, uh, if it implements reasonable procedures to protect the information collected, uh, and others about information storage, uh, deletion, and collection. We also included a, a no criteria transmission principle that we use as a control to see how adding any of these requirements from the law end up changing uh, the expectations that parents have around their toys' privacy. So once you've collected all of these lists uh, that were manually generated of relevant parameters, 
we can then programmatically uh, generate all possible five parameter combinations to come up with a long list of information uh, transfer descriptions to plug into a survey in vignette format. So here uh, we ended up with uh, 1,056 questions where each question uh, proposed one particular information flow and then asked the survey respondents how appropriate they viewed that flow on a five point scale. In this particular example, we're looking at a uh, toy walkie-talkie that was recording the times it was used. Uh, and uh, we're asking you know, for the manufacturer, the third-party service provider, how acceptable is that collection practice? Uh, this particular question uses uh, the empty or the no criteria transmission principle. And then in the following question, uh, we have uh, the same structure, but we fixed the recipient as the manufacturer of the device, and now we're asking for how the appropriateness changes based off of uh, the criteria uh, of the transmission principles that we pulled from the law. Uh, so once we had uh, generated all of these questions and put them into a survey format, uh, we tested the survey with uh, cognitive interviews to make sure that it made sense to respondents. And to do this, we used a service called UserBob, which allows you to post a survey or a website, and then uh, work, crowd workers will review your uh, service or website, provide audio feedback, and, you, and record their screen as they go through and do it. So we can watch these videos, and we can see if they're having any issues with uh, comprehension as they work through the survey. Based off of these interviews, we made a few changes to improve readability and uh, decrease cognitive load. And then we deployed it uh, out to 195 US parents with children between the ages of three and 13. Uh, and this is the largest survey of US parents um, regarding uh, privacy of smart toys that we could find in the literature. And we recruited this particular panel of uh, parents uh, through Scent, which is a uh, uh, online service which will allow you to specify uh, participant panels that you're interested in uh, and, and uh, co do compensation for them accordingly. Uh, so once we have all of these responses, we end up with a fairly rich data set uh, because each question asks about some combination of the five inf uh, information flow parameters. And so in order to start to dig in and figure out what are the actual things here that are, that are mattering and that are affecting parents' norms, we group all of the survey responses uh, by various combinations. So in the first case, we would take an individual parameter. We would say, OK, here are all the questions that ask about information transfers to a device's manufacturer. And then we could do some statistics and see you know, how do those information flows compare to a different set, uh, which maybe included all of the transfers to a third party. But of course, there's more going on here than just individual parameter effects. There's really complicated cross-parameter um, effects that are going on and affecting how uh, parents are thinking about uh, their children's privacy. So to try to get at these um, higher order interactions, we next looked at pairs of parameters. So we would take all flows uh, that had uh, both to its manufacturer and also if its privacy policy permits it. And we could do the same for any uh, pairwise uh, combination and start as we go through and do these comparisons to get a sense of you know, where are these interactions between uh, parameters and between elements in these vignettes actually influencing parents' norms. And finally, we can do the same thing with participant demographics to see if there are subpopulations of parents in our study that have significantly different uh, opinions about privacy that we might want to look at more closely. And once we've done these groups, we can compare uh, the acceptability scores that were given by respondents on the survey. Uh, so now, once we have done all that, I want to go uh, a little bit into detail about the results uh, that we found. Uh, so first, I think it's worth it to take a look at one example of what this data looks like. So this is um, a figure pulled from the paper where we have the acceptability scores of all of the flows that are grouped by uh, the subject attributes and by the transmission principle. So this is a bit of an eye chart, and I'll go into detail about what we can take away uh, a bit later. But for example, the, the small box in the heat map in the upper left corner uh, is the acceptability score over all respondents who rated the question uh, of flows that were collecting uh, the owner's child's heart rate uh, and uh, trans using a transmission principle about um, uh, the, that the uh, parent had given consent. And so we group that into the notification and consent category. So what do we see from looking at this, uh, this graph? Well, first of all, somewhat surprisingly, we see that uh, parents' norms are far more in alignment with COPPA than we expected going into this study. So the two columns that I've highlighted over on the right 
uh, are the two columns of information flows where either uh, that particular flow was disallowed by COPPA or it doesn't include any indication of a data handling uh, criteria. And for the most part, uh, all of those uh, data collection practices were viewed as negative on average by the parents. But if you look at the rest of the flows to the left uh, of the two that I've highlighted, most of them are positive. And all of those included some sort of mitigating uh, criteria that was drawn directly from COPPA, whether that was about a privacy policy permitting the flow, the parents being notified, the data being deleted after it was needed, et cetera. And we went into this study really expecting that even with those criteria, parents would take a fairly hard line about data collection about their children. Uh, and that wouldn't be enough uh, to have a significant influence uh, on their perceived appropriateness of the data collection. And so the fact that we see here that, no, those, those criteria really do change uh, when compared to uh, the control, how parents are viewing these flows, makes us think that, you know, to some extent, COPPA is um, moving in the direction that is aligned with parents' ideas, uh, even if there are details about uh, technical implementations or enforcement problems that may be preventing it from going as far as they would like. The general spirit of the things that COPPA is concerned with is aligned with the general spirit of uh, things that parents are thinking about in terms of their children's data. Uh, so that was the, the, the major takeaway from the study, but we also found um, many other smaller results that we think are equally interesting and we'd like to point out. Uh, so first of all, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found that parents really dislike targeted ads from data from their children. So this particular column uh, that I've highlighted is about uh, flows with the transmission principle if the information is used to serve contextual ads. Uh, and, and contextual advertising is actually a specific uh, exemption in COPPA where only a certain type of information is allowed to be collected by children for contextual ads. But we can see here generally that parents view advertising based off of their children's data as uh, unacceptable. We also found, in this case I think somewhat discouragingly, that uh, transmission principles based off of notification and consent were more influential than those based off of confidentiality and security. Uh, so generally, uh, in, the, in the left category, we have uh, criteria around you know, parents being notified before data is collected, uh, parents having given consent uh, before data is collected. Or in the right category, we have uh, criteria around prompt deletion, secure storage, uh, and uh, encryption, although we didn't use encryption uh, as a word, we used um, some unreadable transit or something that would be more understandable to parents. And, and we found that this was sort of showing that the emphasis on notification and consent that has been prevalent not only in our community but in the news and in recent regulation like GDPR is reflected uh, in parents' opinions. And I want to make sure that we emphasize that there's not necessarily a causality um, going on there. Uh, it's just that uh, parents sort of are still viewing notification and consent as primarily important, even though we know as a security community that there are a lot of issues with existing consent mechanisms, especially around privacy policies uh, and repeated requests for consent around technical issues that parents may not understand. Also, we found um, that uh, as has been shown in previous work, data collection by first party manufacturers is viewed as being more acceptable than by third parties. Uh, and I think it's important to point out here as well that we chose these two recipients rather than anything more specific because they're the two distinctions that COPPA actually makes. Uh, and we might say that given that parents are making a distinction between these two categories, we might want future regulation to be even more specific and break down these further. Because you could imagine that um, there could be a wide difference in the appropriateness of a particular third party getting children's information than a different third party, depending on their uh, interaction with the device uh, and the purpose to which they're putting the data to use. Uh, we also found that parents who self-reported being familiar with COPPA view the data collection as being more acceptable. We um, thought a bunch about this uh, as to why that might be the case. And I know that this was not just a small fraction of the parents. Uh, around 60% noted they had at least heard of COPPA in some sense. And we wondered, of course, at first whether this was some maybe false sense of security where they viewed the, the existence of COPPA being in place as protecting their children's privacy. Although, if you followed uh, any of the news around smart toys over the past few years, you know that that might not necessarily be the case. 
Uh, and then finally, we found that uh, older parents overwhelmingly view data collection uh, from smart toys as being less acceptable. And here you can see there's a pretty sharp cutoff between uh, the participant categories of younger than 45 years of age and older than 45 years of age. Uh, so once we had uh, taken a look at those re um, results, oh, we'd like to su suggest a few opportunities for using this method uh, and applying it to other uh, research projects in the future. So we think, we think that this uh, general technique of using CI to frame surveys uh, in order to compare regulation versus uh, privacy uh, norms on the ground can be fairly effective. And so we'd like to see it applied to other privacy regulations uh, like HIPAA and FERPA and GDPR. Uh, and we also think that it could be useful for people who are drafting regulation and policymakers to see whether or not the things that they're proposing are actually lining up uh, with the opinions of the people who that legislation will affect. And this could better inform policymaking uh, in a more iterative way rather than having to wait for uh, someone like us to do the study after it's already been in place. And then finally, we'd like to repeat studies like this over time, because a lot of times a regulation is created not necessarily to um, align with existing norms, but to try to push populations toward viewing different things as being acceptable. Uh, so you could imagine that if we were to repeat this study uh, a few years from now, after smart toys had become more prevalent, we might see that the overarching uh, population norms have started to shift one way or the other. And it would be interesting to see how the presence of different regulation or different products in the market can start to move people's expectations uh, in one way or the other. Uh, so just in quick conclusion, we used a survey uh, to compare COPPA to parents' privacy norms. And we found that generally uh, the data handling requirements that were put in place by COPPA do significantly increase uh, the acceptability of data collection from the toys. However, we really want to make uh, the caveat that there are untested contextual factors and there are technical specifications that aren't in COPPA, which we didn't test, and you can imagine could go on and further strength strengthen the regulation. And last but not least, enforcement matters. So no matter how strong COPPA is on paper, if uh, toys aren't being held to that standard, then parents, uh, even though they may think they're protected, may not be when they go to the store to buy things for their children. Uh, so thanks for listening. I'd like to take some questions. And if you have any other uh, interest in work that we've done, I encourage you to go and, and check out on the website. Thanks. Hi, uh, yeah. Damien from Google. Um, thanks to you for the great talk. I have a question about uh, third party mm -hmm. uh, and the notion of third party both in COPA and in uh, survey uh, respondents sort of uh, perceptions. Uh, there's this m uh, misconception sometimes uh, we see in the press and in uh, public discourse between what a third party is between, let's say, uh, if I'm an IoT manufacturer and I use AWS to store my data mm -hmm. versus I put a tracking in my app that will go to like some advertising company. Mm -hmm. um, what's, like, what does COPA mean by third party in that context? Like, is, is, is a data processor uh, a third party? And do parents understand the difference between these two things or not really? Right. So at least in this context, we are interpreting third party as the manufacturer of the toy. So if you purchased a toy from you know, company X and that was the company that was on the box, that was the first party for the purposes of this study. Although you raise a very good point about the diversity of third parties, uh, and I would like to see follow-up studies that make distinctions between like crash reporting services, cloud services, uh, data aggregators. I think that some one problem of going ahead too quickly on that is that we start to get past where parents and survey respondents actually understand what those entities are doing in the ecosystem. And so you'd want to be careful that you're not asking questions about things that they don't necessarily understand and then trying to infer um, norms off of that. Okay, Nina Taft from Google. Uh, thanks also for a really interesting talk. I wanted to ask you about your observation on the fact that parents sort of preferred the notice and consent model to the security things like retention and, and, and deletion and that sort of stuff. So. Um, it's my own guess that that's perhaps because they're less educated about what those techniques actually do or why, why they're useful. But users do use the, learn these things over time. So I'm wondering uh, if you were able to break that down by age. Did you find the younger parents who were a little more sort of happy or felt good about deletion and, and all that sort of stuff, retention and that yeah. stuff? I'm not sure about that exact pairing offhand, but I can, I can check and get back to you offline. 
Um, what I do think, though, is that for some of the questions about security, that if the criteria is not explicitly put in the description of the flow, that parents may be assuming that some of that already exists. Uh, especially when the descriptions of security get more technical, it may be that parents, especially who are reporting familiarity with COPPA, and so they know there's some government regulation already in place, even if they don't you know, explicitly read that the data will be protected when it's transferred, that may not make them assume that it is not protected while it's under transfer. So, okay. Thanks. Thank you, Noah. Great, thanks. Okay.